Bill Moore, committee member. Bill McDaniel, finance committee member. Mike Burke, CFO. Mike Burke, CFO. Leon Evans, treasurer. Evans, treasurer. Rick Miller, committee member. Rick Miller, committee member. And we have guests here. And we have Anna. 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 We have Anna. 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 Okay. And then online, okay. we've already yeah, won announced for them. Yes. And I just okay. want to make sure that our members, you need to speak into the mic. Right. So the mic. We can hear right. you in the room, but the people, but the people online will be able to talk into the mic. Talk into the mic. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Well, again, welcome. Uh, well, Bill, um, our, our first item is to approve the agenda. Um, oh, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Okay. Second. Second. Any, any, uh, all in favor? Uh, all in favor? Uh, all in favor? Uh, all uh, agenda is approved. Next item is approval of amendments of October 30th. I'll, I'll make that motion. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. That's 2020. Second. That's 2020. Yeah. That's like it says 2021. It was October, it was October 2020. 2020. So it says 2021. So it says 2021. Done. And you tell me when you need me to you need move to faster. faster. Welcome, Steve. Let's Welcome start with that. Hope you're he healthy. All right. And all. Very good. Uh, Leanne, can you hear me okay? Just to make yes. sure. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Very good. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope everyone is uh, doing well. I, I miss seeing everybody personally, so I hope that... Uh, Sometime later on this year, we'll be all back in person. And I, I trust that all the committee members are doing well and everybody else on the phone. I know it's been a stressful uh, 2020 and I'm sure we can all agree that we're glad that year is gone and, and we hopefully can move on to a better year. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time here giving an update on the investments. As you can see, we're, we're glad to see 2020 go away. Uh, 2020 was a, a year where the Fed had to step in. If you remember back in March, uh, stepped in and cut interest rates extremely low by 150 basis points. Uh, from an interest rate perspective, the short-term rate, which affects Leanne's uh, short-term investment opportunities, uh, were dramatically reduced by the Fed in back in March, which was their uh, response to the economic shutdown and COVID-19. Uh, that's of course has hampered uh, short-term investments and basically for those of you that have been on the committee uh, since the credit crisis uh, we're right back to where we started in 2008 as far as short-term rates in the, in the entire yield curve so we've kind of had to uh, go through some of the same strategies that we employed uh, back in those days uh, here into uh, 2020 and, and that's going to be with us for the next couple of years uh, so obviously with that, uh, the strategies had to change. And I think Leanne's going to talk a little bit more about the, her short-term strategies that we've been working on collectively as a team to kind of navigate through this uh, short-term interest rates. Uh, obviously, I think uh, we are in a situation, thank you, Leanne, we're in a situation where we could see how dramatic uh, rates drop just to kind of refresh your memory. Uh, this this shows you the three-year and 10-year uh, trade yield curve respectfully. Uh, if you remember back uh, to where we were in the beginning of uh, 2020 or the end of uh, 2019, which I kind of dubbed 2019 as the good old days. We had, we had an interest rate yield curve and things were going well. Of course, uh, as always, we had something to complain about and we were complaining about that rates were too low and the economy wasn't moving as fast as we hoped. But uh, in retrospect, uh, we didn't realize how good we had it. And then we came into 2020 and of course, uh, everything uh, changed dramatically. You can see how much interest rates dropped 
Uh, in that same time frame, the equity markets, you know, if you look at the Dow Jones, it dropped about 34, 35% almost overnight. So it's a very dramatic time period. What I want to stress today is that the overall strategy for Palm Beach School Board, uh, given the, its investment policy, given the diversification, uh, the ongoing cash flow analysis that happens uh, with Leanne and her staff on, our, on a daily basis, she's monitoring it. Uh, we're monitoring it on a quarterly basis with her as well as an annual basis. Uh, we, were, we didn't have to do anything major as far as security types. We didn't have to change our overall strategy to adopt to adapt to the uh, uh, unusual economic situation. So we weathered through it pretty well. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about the fact uh, that we expect these uh, situation to be with us for some time. So we'll have to make some adjustments uh, going there. We do see longer term interest rates rising a little bit. Today's uh, 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 employment uh, was up by 49,000 new jobs. We were expecting 50,000 or so. Uh, so that's a good movement for the market as we get into this. I remember talking uh, to the committee back in October and we were very concerned that the winter months would be very challenging for the economy uh, uh, given that uh, testing and now of course the application the vaccines all take place uh, when there's tremendous snowstorms happening uh, that has slowed down vaccination uh, slowed down the economy so those two trains are kind of colliding right now and we saw a slowdown uh, here as far as the economy in the fourth quarter hopefully as the uh, winter dissipates here in another month or two or so at least from the extreme sense it is uh, that will help with the vaccinations, that will help with the economy as we try to roll into a, a better 2021. Leanne, if we can go to the next page, please. I'm sure all of you have been watching uh, the, the cases. We see this every day, so I don't want to spend a lot of time with it. But here are, the, here are sort of the daily averages. Uh, unfortunately, you know, California, Texas, and Florida, and New York are, are among the, the leaders. We don't want to be a leader in this case, but unfortunately uh, we are, and you can see how the number of cases and the the death toll was the highest here uh, in, in January. So the, the COVID-19 is still going with us. Uh, it has uh, been increasing. Uh, of course, we have uh, other situations happening around the country as different variants are popping up and, and we're seeing that here in the United States. So. Uh, it's the race to get the vaccines out uh, to hopefully to get to that 70 some percent uh, immunity that we need for for the country if you will and across the world uh, so we have a long way to go to achieve that next slide Leanne. just looking at some of the economic indicators that are important to look at uh, you'll see here uh, we had some improvements in consumer confidence but uh, as we get into the as we got into this last quarter of 2020, I think folks uh, uh, were dampened by the economic situation and the increase of COVID-19. Uh, that of course is uh, hurting retail sales. Uh, we do expect that as the, I think on the next chart, we have the, the savings rate for United States has been greatly improved. We'll get to that. We'll go ahead, if you go back to that, Leon. sorry, it's another slide or two. Uh, Retail sales were really damp, and we and we we were expecting the economy to go into a slowdown here as we got into the winter months for the reasons I talked about. Uh, new home sales uh, really has done quite well. We're we're experiencing a kind of a national de demographics change in where people want to live. Uh, people people are leaving the you know the big metropolitan cities uh, and looking for the suburban area. The reason uh, new home sales are, are down right now is because inventory is, is really stretched. We don't have enough inventory for to meet this demand, which is why you, you'll see property values uh, not only in Florida, but across the nation have increased. But this is the this is going to be a new shift uh, that we're experiencing. I think, uh, you know, on a side note, home builders are going to have to really kind of revisit how they design subdivisions because people are looking for different kinds of amenities. Um, that they cannot find by living uh, in sort of the typical subdivision. So I, I think we're going to see a, a change in that. Those changes will allow new industries to grow. And we'll, we'll see that happening over the next five years or so. We'll see different types of homes being constructed. We'll see more technology, which was, was some of the stronger economic areas that we've experienced uh, 
in 2020, anything to do with technology, anything to do with supplying uh, those technologies to the, to the home front, if you will, uh, did quite well as different industries adapt uh, to uh, the situation of COVID-19. Uh, so Steve, that was a bright spot here. Yes, sir. It's Rick, um, how do you yes, Rick. see these communities developing? How will they be different when you say they're going to have a different look? Well, I, different? I think you're going to see uh, communities that have recreational centers. You're going to see communities that have sort of a civic center available. Um, you're going to see uh, places that have more parks, uh, more recreation facilities. Uh, sort, sort of more of a self-contained community as opposed to, you know, the typical subdivision with, with uh, just homes and uh, an entrance and that's it. You're going to see these, uh, um, I don't know if anybody's been to the villages, that's probably an extreme example, but you're going to see places that have their own community centers. Uh, uh, shopping centers are going to be probably more uh, specific, smaller and designed to meet those community needs. And that way folks will do less traveling uh, to go shopping and, and less traveling to go to the various amenities uh, that, we, that we generally do now. Sounds like planning um, based on what we have today and expecting it to be forever. So I wonder if that's really the case. Yeah, I, I, I think COVID-19 uh, has changed the mindset of, of a lot. And, you know, I, I think if you listen to the scientists, I, I don't think COVID-19 is the first one. We're going to have more of these as, as, the, as we're going to be faced with this. This is not a one and done. Uh, so uh, I think we need to prepare ourselves uh, for a different environment going forward. Well, Leanne, if we can go to the next chart. Uh, given the fact that we're all sitting at Palm Beach School Board right now, at least virtually, or as some of you are, are uh, in the in the uh, uh, on on the campus there, uh, you can see the the change in total employment per person. This is by education. Uh, you can see how this education is so important, and that really speaks to the kind of jobs that uh, different educated levels can obtain. Uh, the unemployment rate does continue to fall. I think we're about a 6.3 now with today's numbers as job growth uh, increased a bit. Uh, but you can see that uh, unemployment rate uh, dropped from where we were at the start of all this around, you know, 13, 14 percent. And we're, you know, we're getting uh, closer to where we were prior to pandemic, but we still have a ways to go in that respect. And, and there's many industries that are very the state, as you can imagine. Uh, anything to do with uh, travel. Uh, just to give you a little side note, Cape Canaveral, which is, you know, about 50 miles from where I am, is devastated. There's no uh, cruise lines happening, all that shut down. Uh, so tourism is, is really uh, suffering. Of course, Disney World has its own issues, as well as the whole restaurant industry. All those are, are industries that uh, will take some time to come. And, and we have a many of many small businesses that will not come back. Uh, because of the COVID-19 situation. Leah, next page. And that falls right into uh, some other discussions here, whether it's GDP, uh, unemployment that I just talked about, and the PC inflation. The Fed, of course, uh, has taken the, the, the view that the PC inflation is not uh, as, a, as a critical in their decision-making process to whether keep rates uh, or to uh, increased interest rates. Uh, PC was was really a, a big in, indication uh, for the previous Fed chairmen before they would raise rates or cut rates. Uh, that has not as that's not as uh, as big as focus as it was before, and we would expect that the Fed funds rate, uh, as you can see from the chart on the lower right hand side, to remain at these uh, very low rates uh, for the next couple of years. I think that's really dependent on the success of the vaccines, also dependent on people actually take the vaccine. We, we need uh, close to 70 percent uh, uh, to, to be successful, uh, according to current predictions. And I, I see that's uh, going to be part of the success of our economy is the success of the vaccines and how successful uh, we are with the application of that. Uh, so but at, basically at, at current predictions, you know, we can expect these short term rates uh, which has a major effect on on Palm Beach School Board's short-term investments uh, for the next couple of years. Leanne, next page, please. Thank you. 
One of the side benefits uh, is the savings rate. You know, the United States generally does not have a very impressive savings rate. We love to spend. We love our credit cards. We love to, uh, to have instant gratification. I'm one of those people like, like to go and get new stuff, especially technology. Uh, but as we see what happened with COVID-19, folks are a little leery about spending. They're not quite sure where that next paycheck is going to come from. Uh, so we did see the savings rate increase and consumer spending obviously is a negative beneficiary of that savings rate. This is part of the pent up demand that you've been hearing about. Uh, when that's going to be released uh, is, is, is soon to be seen, hopefully, uh, again, uh, dependent on the vaccines, but we have disposable income that folks are uh, been saving. Uh, so the savings rate is a pretty healthy rate compared to, to our normal United States savings rate. And that's sort of the, the demand that's sitting on the sidelines, uh, as well as cash uh, for various corporations have a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines. I think as I talked about earlier in, in the year, we saw a tremendous amount of uh, corporate issuance take place uh, with the idea to, to provide as much liquidity for the companies as possible. We saw a tremendous amount of lines of credits being fully utilized and that cash was then turned around and placed in banks and also a number of local governments actually received letters from their, their depository banks asking them to take money out of the bank because they had too much cash in the bank and were violating comps, the contrary of currency rules as far as daily deposits and, and cash holdings. So a number of local governments throughout the country did receive that request and, and folks had to find a different place uh, for cash, which is an unusual. You typically don't get a call from your bank saying, hey, take some money out. You, it's usually the other way around, but that's the kind of situation that we found ourselves in, in 2020. So just taking another look here, here's some of the Fed policies. I think we reported this a lot uh, quarters. So but just a number of, of Fed policies that we saw in 2020. Uh, many of those, if, if you remember, we saw the very same policies and we had these discussions back in 2008. Uh, again, major theme for the Fed once again was liquidity. Uh, I think we the Fed did accomplish that, plenty of liquidity in the marketplace as we saw pretty much a V-shaped recovery in the equity markets. Where, you know, if you can imagine, we were as low as 18,700 in the, in the Dow, we're over 30,000 now. So a quite, uh, quite uh, impressive recovery, uh, a relatively short period of time if you, if you think about the timeline. But again, the Fed did a, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, liquidity uh, for, for the marketplace. Uh, as you probably seen in the news last night, the uh, uh, the Senate is on its way to probably uh, uh, approve. This was already the 900 billion package. We're going to be at 1.9 trillion dollars, and that's a, a T for trillion. Uh, that's probably going to be on its way, as uh, as we saw last night, and and the Vice President uh, will will of course be that uh, extra vote to get it get it through. So on the next page, you look at inflation. Obviously, inflation has improved uh, since we were the beginning of this uh, 2020. Uh, but again, it, it's not a driving force for the Fed uh, to raise interest rates. I think they will feel comfortable uh, with inflation or that magical line of 2% uh, before they, they start to think about raising interest rates. And on the next chart, well, here, here's the yield curve. Uh, this is all boils down to uh, sort of what Leanne has, Leanne has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with her checking accounts and her various short-term investment options. You can see uh, three months treasure bills on the lower left-hand side of this chart, uh, trading around seven basis points. So we're, we're at, uh, again, historical lows. Uh, but we do, do see a little bit of hope with long-term rates. Obviously, relatively speaking, we're at a 105 for for a 10-year. Obviously, that's a, a very low rate compared to where we've been over the last you know 20, 30 years historically speaking. Uh, but there is there is movement there as the expectation of inflation is to increase. Uh, market participants uh, do see some uh, hopefulness as far as the economy over the next couple of years. So we, that's why you, you see longer term rates starting to, uh, to move, to move up. Uh, but again, the short term rate are, is hot, what the fed is uh, holding short term rates at. Uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, the short term rates here from one month to 12 months, 
this is sort of, again, that's what the short-term portfolio has to deal with with very low interest rates. Uh, even as you look at kernel paper and, and the gold lines there, uh, very low uh, from a return perspective. Okay, so those are some of the major highlights for us. Uh, hopefully, if anybody has any questions, I hopefully gave you a good perspective of where we are and our expectations uh, for 2021. So I've moved into the quarterly investment report. And I'm assuming you want me to go past all the market updates here. Yes, Leanne, if you can go to page uh, 18, I'll have Scott Sweden kind of walk us through the asset allocation chart and the compliance requirements of the investment policy and where we stand with that as of December 2020. Sure. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Good morning, everyone. And I, I can hear that echo quite a bit. <laughs> I apologize. I'll speak quickly. Uh, this slide really serves two purposes. First, if you look at the bottom right portion of the slide, you can see that you're in compliance across the board, given the various security types. And if we focus on the upper portion of the slide, the bar chart, the gold portion of the bar is actually indicating the levels that are permitted by your investment policy. The blue shaded region is actually where the portfolio was allocated at the end of 2020. And for the most part, with the exception of the money market funds, we have quite a bit of room between where you were allocated and what is permitted by your investment policy. So that puts us in a good position as the investment manager when value does arise in the marketplace, we're very uh, flexible to take advantage of that at that point. So it's really just a, a good situation for both of us. And if we can move forward just a slide, Leanne. Thank you. Now, the next probably two slides really are showing you if you're in compliance per individual issuer. And again, you can see across the board on the far right that you are in compliance across the board. And I'll just use this to talk about uh, one specific area. I think it's a, it's a good case study also. On the corporate notes, if you could go back just a little bit, Leanne. Thank you. On the corporate, well, pretty much you can see across the board your investment policy limit per individual issuer is 5%. If we look at the corporate notes, first of all, you can see that you're well diversified across many different sectors. And you can see your exposure per individual issuer is minimal. You can see four basis points, six, two, one. So needless to say, significantly below that 5% barrier. And uh, just a quick case study to give you some background on how our credit committee navigated the volatile markets in 2020 or the, the environment in general. Uh, back in March, uh, you all had one holding of Boeing, which again, minimal, a minimal percentage of your overall account. It was about 142,000. Uh, back in March when Boeing was first downgraded and also to give you some further background, anytime a corporate bond is downgraded, I communicate that to Leanne. I'll communicate the rationale behind it from the rating agency and also give her the rationale behind our current recommendation on the position. So Boeing in particular, back in March when it was first downgraded, primarily due to the issues with the 737 MAX, they were priced roughly in that 90 range. Our credit committee met frequently to say the least every week. We continued to maintain our hold rating. We communicated that to Leanne, the reasoning behind that at that point. And we were actually able to liquidate all of the positions in November for uh, significant capital gains based on where we were at in March. Just to give you a, an example, the maturity of 2021, which you had, we were able to sell above 101, so 101.116. So I think that's basically just a perfect case study on the due diligence that our credit committee puts in, uh, the patience that we have based on fundamentals. 
and uh, we're certainly not emotionally driven. So I think that's really the, the takeaway there. I don't know if you wanted to add anything further on that, Steve. Uh, no, that's good. Thank you. And did you want me to move forward through the returns or? Yes, yes, please. Okay. I'm sorry, was that a question or? A lot of, lot of static. Okay. Oh. Leanne, if you can move to slide 22. Now this is a good slide just to show you the sector allocation, also credit quality in the, the pie charts and the maturity distribution on the bottom portion. And if we look to the left, if, if you're able to, to read that okay, the portfolio statistics, the, I'm gonna really look at yield at market and yield at cost, just to give you an idea of what the portfolio is yielding versus what you would be looking at in the current market. But looking at the total market value, roughly 87.1 million. If we look at yield at cost, that's actually what your portfolio is yielding, 1.35%. Now, yield at market, in theory, if we were to go out into the marketplace and repurchase all of your existing positions, we would realistically be looking at 27 basis points. So give you a pretty good idea of where your portfolio is at versus what is realistic in the current market, which is, you know, what, what Leanne is dealing with on a daily basis that Steve had stated. Yeah, the upside is your effective duration, 1.76 years. So even during this period, we're able to lock in a pretty attractive yield for roughly one to three quarters years. So pretty good position. We can move forward, Leanne. Next slide. Thank you. Now, just for the fourth quarter, we had a pretty healthy outperformance over the benchmark. You had a return of a positive 14 basis points in the quarter, the benchmark at five basis points. So our performance of nine basis points in the fourth quarter. And even looking out over the last year, again, your portfolio outperformed the benchmark by seven basis points. And we can move forward to slide 26. Uh, this is a, a slide that we refer to internally as the accounting page. We tend to talk in percentages and basis points, and I think it's, it resonates a bit more if we just put it in black and white and dollars and cents. So you can see the beginning value at the end of the third quarter, 86.5 million. The interest earned in the fourth quarter, 315,567. And total portfolio earnings just for the fourth quarter were $123,506. So pretty healthy quarter. And we can move forward one slide, Lynn. This is a, a great slide to show you our strategy from quarter to quarter and when we are taking advantage of value or discrepancies in the marketplace. And if we just look at the September 30th quarter versus the fourth quarter of 2020. We can see some differences here. U.S. Treasury, we took a good portion off the table. We reallocated that to federal agencies. You can see that we jumped from 19% up to 
So there was significant value on the federal agency space. And we continue to see value in there just to kind of give you some context. And for the most part, a little bit on the taxable municipal side, we, we found opportunity there as well. But that's just a, a great slide to see how our outlook for strategy is changing as each quarter changes. So. Okay, Mr. Chairman, that should be the, uh, the summary of our report today. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer anything you may have. And if not, we'll turn it back to Leanne. I guess Leanne, your report. Gonna, I'm going to go into the district report right now. And I'm tagging on to a lot of the things that Stephen Scott said. Um, th this shows the entire portfolio and the biggest change, and I think you can capture it with the chart down at the bottom. And I know that's hard to see, but just to point out the big red line up at the top was 2020. 2021 is this dotted black line down at the bottom. That just shows our interest earnings for the year. It's dropped significantly from what we saw last year because the interest rates are significantly less. The other thing that's um, really important, all that Steve and Scott were talking about is the core portfolio. The short-term portfolio, which is all the tax revenue that comes in that we're gonna spend by June. When it came down to it and trying to find investments, even though we could find commercial paper that may have had, and I just pulled up the rate, the gross rate that we would have seen would have been, um, you know, 10 basis points or 12 basis points, once we back off the fees associated with managing them, that includes the custody bank that holds the security and the um, advisory fee, all the rates went negative. We ended up with a net negative rate. So the only money we could eke out is if we were investing in December all the way out to October, November, and December, and we would have picked up um, one or two basis points, a very small amount for locking money in. In these times when there's uncertainty about possible state budget cuts, what's happening with the sales tax. So we did not do a short-term portfolio this year. All the short-term money is in money markets and pools. So the return obviously is incredibly low. And when we made that decision, this is the first time in many years that we have not done a short-term portfolio. I did the chart that said, here's the rates that I got from PFM as expected rates and I added in the fees and I sent it off to PFM. I said, tell me what I'm missing. Am I missing anything? And they said, no. So um, I did work with them before we made that decision, but we'll see a chart in just a minute um, that shows I've, I've captured, I'm gonna skip around just a little bit because I wanna go to that chart. This is that really busy chart I show you every once in a while. Half of the, of the chart is, F, is last fiscal year. It went from July, 2019 to July, 2020. And the, green, the dark green is what was in bank balances, and the orange is what was in the short-term portfolio. In comparison, this year, the dark green, the very small lines at the bottom, it looks almost like graphs at the bottom of the screen, that's what's in the bank. The light green is what is in money markets. So our money market balance is significantly higher. Um, we, are, we are tapping out everything we can put in pools because the return is a little higher there. But the money market rates, just so that you understand, the rate there, the net return is one basis point. So it's really my goal this year, and Steve and I had a long conversation about this, my goal is to make sure we don't have negative returns. I'd love to make money, and the only way we're gonna make any money at all is with the core portfolio. So Steve and I were talking about evaluating once again to see if we can increase the size of that core portfolio. Um, I've been hesitant to do that because there's a lot of uncertainty about the spend with the sales tax and the revenue coming in. I've been working with the construction team and um, some consultants they have, and they have got some projections, and I'm supposed to get them Monday. And when we look at those, we may be able to take all that information along with everything else we have and possibly increase the size of that core portfolio from 85 million up to 100 or 120. Um, I've still got some work to do. I'm not going to forecast what that number is. I may come back and say, sorry, we're not changing anything. But I want to look at that because those investments can go out to up to three years and we can get a quarter of, you know, we can get 0.25%, 0.27 is what we got. I'm going to keep in mind that is still an incredibly low return. 
I'm not going to go out and put the district at risk and take a lot of risk on to eke that much interest out. But if it makes sense, logically we'll do it. But otherwise, the interest earnings for the year are going to be very are going to be very low. And I've I've let Mr. Burke know, and Heather Knuse, our budget director, knows we have budget we've reduced the budget for interest significantly. And unfortunately, this is where we're going to be for the next couple of years. Is what the forecast is. So let's go to sales tax for a second. You said that hasn't declined. That's that is. Uh, um, I've got that thing? chart, and we'll, we'll skip around a little bit because I want to make sure we cover this. Um, the sales tax really has recovered a little bit too far. This is the sales tax, and we were averaging. Our average was 115% lifetime. It's dropped to 113.5%. But the money we've got in for November, we just received that at the end of January, it was 104% of projections. 104%. 104. Mm -hmm. um, the October revenues that came in in December were at 105. So we're back to our projection or slightly above projection. So assuming that holds, and that's what we're seeing, that we're online, that Anybody we're going to... Is there a reason for that? How, how um, people are still are spending. This is local. This is Palm Beach County local. When you look statewide, the number is not as good. Um, I know from talking with folks in Orange, for example, right. their sales tax is down significantly because their tax base is really centered around tourism. So this is all Home Depot and public? It's Home Depot. The biggest contributor in Palm Beach County to sales tax is autos, is buying cars. Right. A lot of people are buying and trading in cars. Um, but, but yeah, the sales tax revenues are back to projection. They're not to the 114, 115% we were seeing before, but it's still above projection. That's amazing. So we're monitoring that. I think a lot of that is also dependent on vaccines and when people are getting back to work, but it, it does look better. Um, we haven't, we still, my latest projections, I've spent a lot of time doing projections with the sales tax. I, I don't. The, unless there's this another there's significant downturns, we shouldn't be able to make our goal that we were, were out. We will not be in a position to shut the sales tax down a year early. Mm -hmm. The only way that would happen is if sales tax jumped up to 125% starting now until through 2026. And I just don't see that happening. Well, that's good anyway. But we're, mm -hmm. we're, it, it's coming along. So we're looking at all the different components and all the pieces and always looking for op opportunities to try to put something out. I, I thought we actually reached out to our trustee bank, the Bank of New York, and we thought about making the June debt service payment early and they could invest the money up there. But they couldn't. They could get a better return, but the fees were higher. Mm -hmm. So it didn't work. Um, I'm always looking for options. And whenever I think of another crazy idea, I call Steve and say, what do you think about this? And we, we go back and forth on how it would work and if it makes sense. But so far, it's money market and pools. And we may come back. Um, one of the things that we're going to evaluate, knowing this is going to be there for a couple of years, we may want to look at increasing the amount for local government investment pools. Not the amount in each one necessarily, but the total amount. We're at 50% in pools and 75% in money market. This is so little money. So I think safety is paramount. I think this committee would agree um, that for Two extra dollars. The rate, about. yes, the rate. There, there, there's rate. not much of a rate. There's not much of a rate, and I think we're probably better than safety than going through a you know mm -hmm. big time pool process. As we did before. That's well, just my observation. Others may have a comment. Well, I'm not going to recommend anything immediately. I want to see how the rest of the year plays out. It may be later on in the year we come back with some ideas. Mm -hmm. But it's just we're exploring options, knowing this is not a three or six months. This is probably two or three more years like this. So we may need to make some changes, but I, I don't know that. Yeah. But we'll continue to explore it and bring you back ideas if we have them. And Steve, the money market funds are safe nowadays? Uh, the pools? The money yes. market funds? Yes. They okay? But I, I say yes, but remember, I work in the world of compliance, so I have to say that based on all the criteria and current credit ratings and diversification, uh, the the LGIPs are meeting those expectations. Yeah, and the money markets are, 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 are we're monitoring those. Um, they're, yes. they're all in compliance. There's, there's new rules and regulations regarding money markets that right. were into place a couple of years ago. 
Right. So, so but, the but question I, to I, you, I, Steve, I, was I, how I, safe are the money markets? And I guess Leanne sort of answered that in that the new rules yeah. ensure their safety. But also, uh, also I think. Uh, okay, hang on just a second, Steve. Your volume hearing. is dropped, and we can't hear. We can't hear. They're, they're, they're working now? to see why we can't hear you. Your volume dropped off. Still oh, whisper. Okay. Maybe if we increase his size, we can increase his voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, well, the, they, there, they did um, tighten up the it. rules regarding money markets. Can't hear you, Steve. Try it now. Can you say something? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Barely. It's really Fair quiet. Early. Maybe you can chat, turn up the volume. I wonder what happened. Try again. Try again. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think it's important before we leave this, this particular topic, Rick, we need to make sure we have a distinction in our discussion between the difference of a money market funds and the local government investment pools. The money market funds are, you know, going to be those funds from, you know, let's say Dreyfus, Franklin, uh, you know, those, those federated, those are the kind of money markets that, you know, many of you might invest personally, but uh, the local government investment pools are designed specifically, just like they're saying, just for local governments. And so the investment policies associated uh, with those LGIPs are probably a little bit more restrictive uh, than the typical money market fund, especially a prime money market fund, which prime money market funds, uh, due to the Money Market Reform Act, have a fluctuating net asset value, whereas the local government investment pools have an amortized cost. Uh, so their share value is always a dollar in, dollar out. There's some, there's some major distinctions here, but also it's really important to point out that not all LGIPs are created equally. So there are differences, and Leanne and I, of course, study those differences, and we have to make uh, decisions based on that. So um, each, each one has to be analyzed but certainly the environment that both money market funds and LGFPs are in today's environment, I mean from a regulatory standpoint, uh, is, a, is a lot different than it was prior to the credit crisis. So improvements have been made, uh, understandings have been changed, and whether it's accounting rules or the SEC rules, uh, they certainly have been modified for the benefit of the investor. So the, the, the chart on the screen right now just shows in the dark green, I know it's hard to see, the dark green is money market, the light blue is pools, the dark blue is invested bank balances. And the there, where you see all the little numbers up here together, the small amounts, that's the core portfolio. So the vast majority of our cash is in money markets, pools, and a little bit in bank balances. It does make it very easy to manage cash right now. It's just, it all goes into money markets and pools, but um, it, it, we're always looking for options. If there's ways that we could get additional interest income without jeopardizing safety and liquidity. I mean, safety is number one and liquidity is number two. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's what we, how we operate. Um, and it, you can see the rates have dropped, the interest earnings have dropped significantly because of that. That's really what I wanted to show you in this report. It, it's, um, I, I'll, I will mention the interest earnings, the number 1.5 million versus the 8.9 million same time last year. So a significant drop off. Tax collections is something I was worried about. Um, property tax revenues continue to come in as normal. Um, for this time last year, we were at 86% of revenues received and we're at 87%. So we're right on target of where we have been in prior years. Um, that's not the case everywhere else in the, in the, in the state, in the country, uh, but we're very lucky that's working as it is, and then sales tax continues to work as expected. So are there any other questions on investments? So I guess we go to now the proposed um, COP issue? Yes, that's the next item, and I'm going to ask Laura to make sure she has her mic turned on because she's going to talk to us about the COPS issue and I promise I'm going to chime in a lot on this one. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Good morning. Okay. 
Um, well, thank you for having us this morning. I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague, Robert, and he's just going to do a brief um, market overdue, overview for you guys um, on the MMD side and what's going on in the issuance side um, before we go ahead and talk about the upcoming certificates of participation. Hey, good, mor good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Robert. Hey, good morning, Leanne. Good morning, everyone. So not... Um, just to follow up on the market update given by uh, Steve and Scott, we're just going to go over the uh, how things have, how the coronavirus has impacted the, uh, the municipal markets. And as you can see on the left, which shows the MMD curve uh, since last year, uh, six months ago, one month ago, and one year ago, you can see that uh, in comparison to one year ago, municipal rates along the curve have are much lower. And you can see that um, the six month, the one month, and the current curve are rather compressed in comparison to where, where it was last year. So they're compressed and it's, it's very low. And uh, the chart on the right uh, shows a similar picture and it shows the range of, uh, of rates uh, along the curve. And you can see by the blue bar, the blue bars, that that's the range. And um, the orange, the orange squares, diagonal squares show the average. And as you can see by the yellow, the yellow dotted lines that the cur uh, along the curve rates are at their all-time low. Rates are at the uh, at the pretty much at the end of of the bar charts, and they're on the lower end of the uh, of the MMD range. So it's uh it's uh it's it's good it's it's good for issuing debt in this in this environment because rate uh, interest rates are, are are very low. And Leanne, could you please move on to the next slide? And then uh, this shows pretty much uh, the the spread between uh, the 10-year Treasury bond and the 10-year MMD curve. And as you can see, um, uh, in February and March, rates spiked as the market was calibrating what was what was going to happen with the uh, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we move along the curve, you can see right where we are now that the spread between uh, tax exempt rates and taxable rates are compressed and the spread is rather small. And if you can continue, please, Leanne, I'll turn it over to Laura, who will, dis who will discuss the uh, anticipated COPS, in COPS issuance. Yeah. Um, so I know last year, um, or it was the end of 2019, we had brought to you the projections of the capital plan over the next five issuances. Um, you know, the strategy is to take advantage of the current low interest rate environment, uh, making sure we're allowing for future capacity, um, staying within the 50% uh, line within the 1.5 mil that pays the debt service. Um, we wanted to make sure that the maturities on the new debt didn't extend beyond 2040 so that the district um, could potentially be debt free by then. Um, we want to size for kind of an aggregate level debt service after the district's debt service drops off significantly in 2029. Um, so when we were looking at it in our last meetings, different strategies we had talked about, we'll just be paying interest through 2029 um, and then be layering the principal in starting in 2030 out. Um, and we always will bring this back to you before each issuance to make sure our strategy still makes sense and it's the best district uh, plan for the district moving forward. So on the next slide, we'll show you, um, this is what happened post issuance of the 2020. So as you can see, the brown tan bars are what the prior debt service was, and the green is layered on top with the 2020A issuance. Um, you can see that starting in 2032, 33 and 34 is where we have principal um, and we just layered that small bit of interest on top to make sure that we weren't increasing MADS and allowing for future capacity moving forward. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and this is just showing you currently where at 100% of the 1.5 mils and at 50% um, of the 1.5 mils where the district falls with their current debt portfolio. So still within the guidelines of wanting to stay under the 50% um, and still having room for capacity down the road. So the upcoming issuance um, on this bar, the TAN is where we currently are. So that includes um, the 2020 issuance that we had just done. So I'd like you to focus in on the green bars um, because this is the next issuance. 
So we have staggered here the next four issuances on top of it. Specifically, the green is what we're looking at um, for this year for um, issuing for the new money costs. And we have this structured to only pay interest through 2034 on this, with principal going from 2035 to 2040. Um, this would allow, if we stick with this strategy, that the debt service, um, once it drops after 2029, 30 and 31, it'll kind of level out about 82 million going out from there. So plenty of capacity moving forward. One of the reasons we're looking at this, and as Robert had mentioned and Steve and Scott had talked about, um, interest rates are really low right now. So putting the principal out through 2040 is taking advantage of um, the low interest rates on the long end of the curve while still allowing the district to have um, plenty of capacity and flexibility moving forward when doing the issuance end. I would like to know, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, um, the little dashed green and white bars. Um, but to pause really quick before we get to that, just any questions on the methodology and what we're thinking as far as the strategy of structuring the debt currently. And I, I'd like to add in at this point, we did the last TOPS issue and it was a wrapped structure. And we had lots of discussions with the rating agencies because they could look down on that, but they had no issue with what we're doing here because so much of our COPs are maturing in such a short period of time mm -hmm. that they agreed it made sense to use this type of rationale and there, there was no concern. And I also want to take a moment, just I'm going to divert the conversation for just a minute, but I wanted to make sure we covered it. Um, some of you may have heard that Moody's changed their methodology for rating um, public schools, K through 12. And that was just released, what, a week or two ago? A week ago. Um, so we were concerned because they changed the methodology pretty significantly, but the district's rating did not change. Um, there are a couple of school districts in Florida that are on being reviewed for possible downgrades. There's throughout the country, I think there was 637 credits, there are 639 that were under review. Some are for downgrades, some are for increase upgrades, um, but ours stayed constant. And we've been in conversation with Moody's. I just spoke with Fitch last week. So they're all paying a lot of attention to what's happening with our budgets. So far, everything's good. I haven't got the rating yet from Fitch, but they sent some more questions yesterday. So just wanted to bring that into double conversation. A? Excuse me? Double A? Um, yeah, we're a double A2 for issuer rating and double A3 for COPS. Okay, double A3. So that, that, that hasn't changed. but. We're in con I just want to brought it up so in case you'd heard about the rating methodology, we did not have a change in rating, but we are talking to the rating agencies, not specifically on this deal yet, but they're monitoring and they know what we're planning to do. So at this point, there's no concern about using this wrap structure. So basically, this is really interest only, isn't it? Yes. Right. Up until 2035. This is a matter of curiosity. Mm -hmm. two, or th two or three sentences on what the major thrust of the Moody's uh, change is. Hopefully yeah. it would be something along how successful you are and in in how successful your work product is, well, for example, but maybe that's too No, they, they actually Hopefully took that, they, they took some of that away. Um, what they did was set up for the first time methodology specifically for schools. We'd always been lumped in with local governments. Uh -huh. So now they're treating schools differently. And we'd always have it had a I don't know the numbers, um, but it, it, the component regarding to management w was a big piece. They've reduced that and increased um, the reliance on or the importance of fund balance, just looking at the fund balance that the district has. So it's a bit of a different look, but they also have the ability to have the credit committee look and take into account things like management. Um, so I, I, they had told me when we had conversations, they, they didn't expect that we would see something, but they had to wait. They have a detailed scorecard, and they use that scorecard, um, and then they do a rating based on that. I don't know if Laura wants to add anything else to that, if I've missed anything. Yeah, I think they, um, you know, the initial proposed methodology, they had taken out um, tax base and um, the size of that component, which is obviously very important for Florida school districts, and so, that is, they did leave a piece in that. Without that, I think a lot more Florida school districts would have been impacted um, potentially in a negative way because obviously the tax base size 
which does directly relate to, um, you know, your ability to issue debt, they were going to remove that, but they did leave that into the final methodology. Um, the increase in fund balance is a hard one for Florida school districts, and that's a conversation we have with all three rating agencies. Um, you know, because of the size of Florida school districts to have a 10 or 20% general fund reserve, is not necessarily um, the best use of funds because that's a significant amount of money as opposed to a really small school district, you know, say in Pennsylvania. Um, they understand that the dollar amount in the reserve fund is very significant and allows for the district, um, you know, to have that money there in, in case they need it. It's just they base it on percent and compare it to national medians and um, I don't know if they'll ever change their viewpoint. All three rating agencies see that, but they do understand how Florida school districts operate um, and take that into consideration. So, um, let me ask you: um, Aren't the school districts' um, costs going up with all the virtual aspect and the increase in plus the buildings, empty the buildings? The construction so. costs are going up, and we and we're we're addressing that. That that's important when we think about the sales tax and. The amount that we're borrowing for cops to build we are dealing with that right now we're also limited as to how much we can spend on a school based on the cost per student station calculation that the state does so sometimes we're dealing with costs going up but the maximum we're allowed to spend doesn't so then we end up having to take things out of the school that we'd like to have in there because we are limited and we can't exceed that cost factor in the state so the school buildings or the equipment whatever is getting to be a lesser aspect in other words there, there is yeah, what, the, what the rating agencies are really looking at is the operating budget yeah. they're, they're looking at our costs and virtual and and mr burke can probably talk about this better than i can but i know cost of virtual we've actually had some savings there um because you don't didn't need oh, like last year we didn't have as need as many substitutes the buses weren't running right. this year the buses are running even if there's a lot f much fewer kids on them the buses were still running all the routes um, it's very hard to find substitutes um, so we're balancing that out. We said last year we put a freeze in place to save everything we could possibly save when the pandemic hit, and that was very successful. We were able to set money aside. That plus the money from the CARES Act and the ESSER grants and the other money coming in. So far, we've been able to stay within that. The question is really next year's budget, and I'm going to let Mike chime in about that. So Leanne, you're right on. Uh, we saved about 27 million at the end of last school year during that kind of that last quarter. When we shifted to totally virtual, we did save money on utilities, diesel fuel, substitute teachers, that type of thing. And that money's helped us get through this year uh, along with the CARES Act grant. Looking at next year, you know, we just got the governor's budget recommendation uh, late, about a week ago. And that was actually a pretty favorable budget for education. It protects the K-12 schools and actually adds $132 per student. Uh, so that was, that was good to hear, but uh, the bad news is that budget may not make it. You know, the, the House and Senate are already kind of saying that's a, that's a heavy lift to try to protect education in a year where the state's facing a $2 billion general revenue shortfall. Our, our share of that $2 billion for education could be $700 million or so. Uh, the one thing that may naturally reduce the, uh, the burden on the legislature is the decline in enrollment. The state's down about 80,000 students. And the tough question is how many of those 80,000 kids will be back in school next year or how many are kind of gone for good that have gone to private schools or home education. Uh, but that decline in enrollment will take pressure off the state budget. That's, that's you know, if, if we're down, if we're still down 50,000 kids next year, that's about 400 million the state will not have to pay for. So we're really watching the state budget closely for next year. Uh, the good news is that second round of stimulus that was approved uh, late in December will provide our district about $156 million. Um, and that money is good for the next two school years. So we're gonna have to be strategic how we use it. The, in, the intent of that additional federal money is to really try to address the learning loss. You know, we, we're really concerned about uh, kids that have, you know, fallen behind during this period, during the pandemic. And our early, you know, we've done some diagnostic testing and there is cause for concern. You know, it's, uh, it's particularly like, our uh, deputy superintendent was talking about math, you know, the math scores are way down. And he said, you know, that math is tricky. You know, you have to teach that all sequentially. 
and it kind of builds upon itself. And so I, not all the kids are flourishing in this online environment. And, uh, you know, we do have some kids in our own district here. We're missing about 7,000 students that, uh, you know, are not with us this year. And we're trying to round them back up. So the, the two big, I guess, things to watch is depending on how the state budget fares, um, we could see some reductions. And then with our enrollment, I'm expecting a certain amount of budget reductions just in line with that enrollment. Um, we, can, we can manage that, um, and the federal money is probably going to be the saving grace. You know, um, it'd be nice if the state did not cut us, and then we could use those federal dollars for really what they're intended for to try to catch the students back up. Uh, but if the state cuts us, I'm probably going to have to get a little more creative and try to use the federal money to mitigate the impact of any state reductions to the extent possible. Can you do that? Is the money not for COVID ex related there's expenses? It comes th from the there's, you know, there's pretty, there's a lot of different uses for the federal money. I mean, they've given us pretty wide, la you know, some good latitude on how to use those dollars. Um, we went through this during the Great Recession. You may recall there was the American, the, what we call the Air Funds, which was the American Recovery and Reinvest Reinvestment Act. Yeah. And that did allow us to shift some of our existing personnel around uh, for two years. And then you have to, you have to really, it gives you some, buys you some time to really figure out how you're going to, you know, bring your budget down or, or um, you know, hopefully the revenue recovers. But yeah, there may be some ability to do that. We might have to redirect some of our personnel. I recall uh, during the Great Recession, we created temporary jobs. They were, they were only good for two years, but they were called RTI facilitators, which were to, uh, it was a, gr a great benefit for our schools. They worked directly with students. And, uh, I don't remember what RTI stands for now, <laughs> but it was, it was something that was came out of our exceptional student education department. But anyway, there may be some ability to do that, um, you know, to provide, use the monies to really for their intention to help students, but do it kind of in a creative way that also takes pressure off of the general fund operating budget. So that's what we'll be working through in the months ahead. You know, the decline in enrollment alone right now, that's our we're meeting today to try to uh, estimate. The state has had such a hard time trying to forecast re enrollment for next year. They kind of threw their arms up a week or two ago and said, we're going to need each of the 67 districts to really provide us their best estimate and their logic behind that. So we're working on that. Um, it's just, it's tricky because, you know, we're down about 7,300 kids this year. Uh, some of those are kindergarten students that never joined us. You know, that there's a talk of like parents that may have just held their kindergartners back for a year to kind of wait out the pandemic and then bring them to, you know, that hopefully they'll enroll next year. Mm -hmm. So we could have, hopefully there'll be a larger kindergarten class next year. Um, we've got a lot of families that have gone to either virtual or home education, out, you know, outside of the district. And uh, I think we need to market to try to bring them back into our schools. And hopefully with the, you know, as people get widely vaccinated maybe that'll alleviate some concerns but that that's kind of the million dollar question right now you know how many of those 7300 kids do we expect back next year uh, the state model had us you know they were kind of optimistic that we should maybe bring back about half of them and uh, I'm you know we're just trying to do our best thinking we're looking at birth rates we're looking at everything to try to uh, to nail that down and we're, we're not quite there yet it's tricky you know you don't want to be overly conservative because if, if every district across the state takes a very conservative approach and says well you know we're only going to get back 10 or 20 percent of those kids we feel like then the state will build a budget on too few of students potentially right. next year and then we get hit with what they call a prorated holdback um, so that number is critical because the legislature needs a good number so that they can figure out exactly what they're able to fund and we'll have you know that funding would be stable if we missed a mark significantly across the state then it typically we end up with a mid-year reduction because if the enrollment comes in above the state budget, they simply just give us fewer dollars per student. That's no, we got a of curiosity. Yeah. Do you do you do you know do you monitor what the size of the private school, parochial school population is in the county? Is, is, it, is there some some num some percentage of this number that's fallen off? I mean, you mentioned homeschooling, but you didn't mention private, uh, non, yes. non-public schools. We do. We monitor. I guess, I mean, is 
that a, that's a separate category as well? That is a separate category, and we, and we definitely, uh, particularly in the more affluent parts of our county, we saw some flight to private schools because the private schools came out early on and said, we're going to be open in person. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, where we were still saying, look, we're probably going to be online for a while, or maybe you'll have both options. Uh, but there was, yeah, we definitely had a, a, some loss to private schools. And now it's, it'll be interesting to see if that the private schools retain those students. Or we're not sure, we, yeah, we can break it down. We, but yeah, we look at, the, we break it down. Uh, we can see if students have left Palm Beach County to go to another Florida district or they've gone outside of the state. There has been mobility, you know, if, uh, if the parents lost their job here in Palm Beach County, maybe they moved back home with the grandparents or what have you. It's a long list. We have high school kids that have jumped into the workforce and they're just not able to, you know, they've dropped out of school to help support their families and bring money into the household. Um, so it's kind of a long list. The, the, the scariest group was there was about, and the, this started we, when we first were looking at, we had over 3,000 kids that, we, that appeared to be missing in action. We couldn't find them. And uh, we've scrubbed through that data and located some of those students and we're actively pursuing those students to try to get them back in school. We've got that list down to about 1,300 and there's a team of people working. Uh, they work in extra hours. So working from four till eight o'clock at night, you know, calling families, uh, knocking on doors if they have to, to try to just, and they're having success. They're saying that's really, that personal touch is what it takes sometimes to reconnect families and get their kids back in school. But that, that's one of the most alarming figures is that there's a pretty significant number of kids that have just dropped out of school and in, you know, of all ages, and uh, we really need to get them back in the classes, yeah. classroom. So the uh, enrollment is a, uh, is a kind of a key factor for next year that we're 7,000 out of how many? Out of Just about 170,000. About 170, so about three. About four, yeah, four almost 4%. 4%. Wow. Um, it's a lot, and then some of them are missing in action altogether. Yeah. Located. Yeah, so we're uh, the social workers, and the, or we've got a team that's in our safe schools department. They've taken it, that's their mission. Is that now. a certain category, a certain area that has, suffers more? No, it's, no uh, income well, uh, of those students, we, we broke down the data. The, the most, uh, what you would expect, over 65% of those students were on free and reduced lunch. Yeah. So it does seem to be linked to income, you know, and poverty level. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's it's boys and girls of, of all ages, and the only thing that was kind of the overriding uh, demographic was that the, the that free and reduced lunch status. Yes, they were mostly free free lunch. Yeah, yeah. that's the bulk of it. Okay, I'm going to pull us back onto the cops issue for just a minute, um, and. Ms. Bill, I rem rem realize that we need to take a vote because the committee will need to vote to approve the COPS issue. Yes, right. And we need to do a vote of the people here in the room to allow Mr. Dumars and Mr. Coner that are online to participate. Okay. So the general counsel has given us the option to do that. So okay, I'd like so to- So tell us the d size of the issue. Um, okay, well, if we could go ahead and do the vote to allow them to participate first. Oh, to allow them to participate? Right. Sure. All, um, we I'll make a motion to let the electronic uh, uh, people Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. <laughs> okay. Vote. Okay, good. Thank you. I just wanted, I realized we hadn't done that yet, and I wanted to make sure before we ever got to a vote <laughs> that, that we had. So we whatever had you've that. said before doesn't count. <laughs> well, it's what the committee votes on. The committee hasn't voted on anything yet, okay. except for the agenda and the minutes, and we have a quorum. So I, but I wanted to make sure that. Mr. Conner and Mr. Dumars had an opportunity to talk if they wanted to. Um, so for this COPS issue, I think, Laura, do we need, do, I, do you want me to explain the taxable piece before we go any further? Um, sure, well, just to address, I, I think the question um, we're looking at about project funds, uh, you wanna just um, discuss the white and green right. piece. Um, the, um, the whole transaction is about 144 million. There are three projects in this COPS issue. There is a new high school um, out off of Lyons Road between Lake Worth and Sixth Avenue. Um, we call it Triple O. Um, it's $103 million. It's a big chunk of this budget. 
Um, then there's an elementary school that's in Beaufortone. The land was donated by the city of Beaufortone. It's right next to where Don Estridge is. Um, so there's an elementary school. And then the third project is a new building and a renovation of a building at, at Delray Full Service, which is in Delray Beach. And so we're going to be tearing down some buildings, putting in a new building, a two, I think it's two or three stories, I'm not sure, but a big building that's going to be primarily for adult education. And then we're remodeling the historic gym that's there. And the way those buildings are going to be used is a little different than a traditional K-12 building. And there are rules when you're using tax exempt financing that you can only use it for the original purpose. You can't have things going on in there that are bringing in a lot of money. And there's going to be a small museum in that um, gymnasium. There's going to be public use spaces which makes me very nervous about doing tax exempt debt. So the plan is to do a small portion of this transaction just for this one school, which is a little less than 10 million. Um, this is gonna be done taxable so that we don't have to worry about private use. So I'd ask um, Laura and Robert to put together a slide to talk about the difference between taxable and tax exempt debt. Um, but I, we've we have not done taxable debt at the district. So I wanted to make sure we disclosed that we talked about that. Um, the county we does did it all some the time. Tax, didn't we do some taxable debt on that special program? We did on the Q-Skib and Q -skib. Build America Bond. Yeah. Um, that was an instance where we did taxable and the Treasury Department is giving us the difference between right. the taxable and tax exempt rate. Almost. We still have to follow Almost. the public use rules right. mm -hmm. and we didn't get everything the Treasury Department promised. Right. Um, they keep reducing it. and it's running months late in getting that money to us. So it's not something I jump into doing again anytime soon. But um, this one just would be taxable, which is what the county uses when they're building stadiums or convention centers. It's used whenever there's a possibility you're bringing, gonna make revenue on it. And the, the other thing that concerns me, even if I know exactly how the building will be used now, that doesn't mean that's how it's gonna be used the 15 to 20 years, the debt may be outstanding. So I want to make sure we're not tying the district's hands into how that facility will be used. So we'll have a small component of the transaction that would be taxable. The good thing is the interest rates overall are so very low right now, we're at historic lows, that it, it's not a, a, a huge increase in rates. And I'm gonna turn it back to Laura and Robert. Yes. So um, this graphic, and we just wanted to start off with this one because where we showed the green and white striped bars, that's in the 15 year maturity um, of what we were looking and doing the issue in. So if we kept all of the principal um, starting out in 2035 um, on this transaction, we would load all of the taxable piece in 2035 to keep it on the short end. Um, and so this is just showing you the spreads between the 15 year taxable and geo rate. And so it's hovering right now about 90. Um, obviously last year in the pandemic, um, those spreads really tightened. So this is something we're gonna be monitoring moving forward and we include it on the next slide so that you can see um, the spreads between a five year taxable rate um, for general obligation um, at the AAA rate. And it's much lower. We're looking at 35, 40 basis points on the spread. Um, so Leanne and I discussed this that when we go to market because it is such a small piece um, only you know nine ten million dollars that we could always bring that principal portion to the front where we currently only have interest mm -hmm. we would still make sure that we're staying under that 50% line up there um, so that we're meeting meeting those requirements as well but so that we're not paying um, too much more in interest of backloading it. So if the spreads are still pretty wide at um, 90 basis points between taxable and tax exempt, we would look at just kind of spreading that over, um, you know, two to five years on the front end. Right, and so, so that's that essentially this green and white stripe would be spread up at the first five years, which mm -hmm. would reduce our borrowing costs. The other thing I'm keeping in mind is the sister school to Delray Full Service, which is Roosevelt Full Service, would be in next year's COPS issue and we'll have the same exact issue that we'd wanna do taxable on that one as well. So I'm trying to plan ahead on what this would look like if we had the taxable portion in, as of the beginning of the curve. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna to continue to work on that depending on what marking conditions are. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you all have always given us latitude on the structure. We always have you look at it. This is what kind of what we plan to do. And then we tweak it based on what's going on in the market the day we're pricing, which we're hoping to price this. We're getting board approval on, well, assuming you all approve it, it goes to the board March 3rd and assuming they approve it, we'd be looking late March, early April, probably. So it, it just depends on what's happening in the marketplace. But it would look something similar to this. It's just maybe I increase the amount in green and next year in blue um, to have the taxable piece mature sooner. Let me ask you, um, does it make sense to, ha to do that rather than spread it out over a longer period of time? Because I see you're, you're, you're increasing the amount, and particularly in times where money's in right. important, the amount of principals paid in those early years. Yeah, I was going to say, Leanne, if you want to hop, um, I think, to the chart graphic that we kind of, um, I think it's after this one. Yes. Just to show you um, on this slide as well, for the 2021 issuance, that's $144 million. And this is what we showed you, which we always like to show you the most conservative approach, which would be, you know, the highest interest rate of keeping that taxable piece at the 15-year your true insurance cost right now is only about 2.64% um, is what we're estimating for 20 year money, 19 um, year money. And so if we moved it to the front end, um, we would anticipate that that would be even um, lower than what we're showing right here. Mm -hmm. um, this is still great rates to borrow. So if you wanted to keep the capacity on the front end, potentially if property revenues um, don't keep increasing, over the years, this is still very attractive. We just know that if it's currently on the front end of the curve where rates are today, there would be less of a difference between um, tax exempt and taxable. It may be that we leave this transaction exactly as we showed it. Mm -hmm. And for the FY22, mm -hmm. the rate, the spread could be higher in a year from now. And it may be that we want to reserve our ability to do that with the next deal, knowing there's another component. It's just, we're, we're looking at all these pieces. Mm -hmm. Leanne, it's Michael. I have a question. Okay. Um, I mean, is how much additional fees and costs will go in to have to do a second bond offering of this taxable component? The, as far as um, rating agency fees and the underwriter's discount, that's all going to be based on your par amount. Um, we'll issue it as an A and B series in the document. So it'll still be one issuance just with two series in it to separate the two of them. Um, I, I think, I don't know if Bob 30 reached out to Leanne. I'm not sure if there's a difference in attorney's fees for doing a taxable and tax exempt piece. But overall, most of the fees that we pay in this transaction would be based on your project fund. So having a separate taxable piece um, isn't going to be, you know, costing you any more than if you had uh, two tax exempt pieces. Yeah, they're marketed at the same time, typically out of the same document. And so there's, it's, it's in the order of thousands and not hundreds of thousands. Thank you. David Moore, I didn't even know you were on the call today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed, I was supposed to not talk, but uh, I couldn't help. <laughs> okay, so what we're looking at today is just the 2021 issuance, the 144 million, and so that that's what we're really bringing for today. The other, we always we're bringing you everything that's planned over the 10-year window, just so you know what else is coming, and going back to this this chart that I'm, I'm always looking at this chart just to see where we are capacity wise and to make sure that it makes sense. I mean, what we did with the last transaction, we wrapped it around to where everything matured in 2035, 34, I think. Mm -hmm. um, 32 to 34 in this range. Right. So this is going out a little further. We could, I mean, in theory, we could say, let's not run it out to 2020, 20, the last one we did, it didn't go out to 2040. It was sooner. Um, the reason it's gone out further is because the rates are just so incredibly mm -hmm. low mm -hmm. that it makes sense. Any comment on this? Bill? Well, well, I just generally think that uh, you get all get everything you can while you can because uh, you know. And, uh, I mean, if the, if the economy improves, obviously, long in, long long into the curve is going to increase. Right. And uh, and 
sooner or later, uh, uh, modern monetary theory is going to catch up with us, and uh, and uh, inflation is going to arrive right. and with a vengeance. So, I in mean, other words, take, get it while you can. Help you help yourself while you can. Right. Mm -hmm. it's just my general. Yeah. Uh, and general but on the admonition. length of it too. How about on the length of it too? Oh, right. long long as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the underpinning of the strategy is with rates as low as they are the if you have a multi-year capital plan when you're at what you believe to be the lowest rates that's the debt you lock in for as long as as possible um, and and that's why we structured it the way we did keep in mind the bonds are callable at 10 years so when you get to 2030 and the debt surface drops you can you could always prepay those at that point in time and and you could shorten up the, the total maturity by three or four years easily so i i think that raises a, a obvious question does it make sense to do a bigger deal this year well you run into issues we can't go out you know i was i was when you look at the list of what we had planned for 2022 um we can't borrow for something that's not going to start for another year because the money is supposed to be spent within three years. So those projects are not ready to start. They're just getting started with the planning. So I don't even know exactly how much well, to borrow for arbitrage. the future deal. I mean, the point there is you can't arbitrage beyond that period, but you can restrict your yield. Right. And you're not going to make any arbitrage anyway, are you? Do you make any arbitrage? Could have negative interest. Yeah. I, I was so, just thinking of avoiding the increase in rates. No, no, I yeah, know what no, you're I saying. Agree. What, 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 what uh, Jack's getting at is uh, why not issue more this year if possible, take care of next year's as well. Uh, you could limit your arbitrage on that uh, if you need to, but I don't even know that you'd need to well, the, since the, you can't earn anything. Yeah, the concern I have is the projects that are in planned for 2022, yeah. I still don't know what they're doing. I don't know which Not exactly formed. what the schools are. Yeah. Um, we would have to get all the real estate work it, done, right. and not all ready. that data is not ready yet. Yeah. Um, I've actually thought about trying to move things up, but I'm working really closely with the construction department. Uh, for those of you who are on the sales tax committee, you get to hear that, but um, I'm in their meetings. I'm meeting ha more than half my time is just with construction right now and what they're doing to make sure they're staying on target and that we're managing the budget appropriately, and we're not ready to know how much to borrow yet mm -hmm. for 2022. I, I agree, gosh, if we could, we could lock in these rates and take advantage of it, but we're just, we don't have the yeah, data no, we need I'm yet. Saying within the other constraints, I'd mm -hmm. like to yeah. take as much as you can. That's good, it's good input. And obviously once that data is ready with Leanne, I know on here we have, you know, assuming that it's next April as well, but that's something, if, you know, that information is ready and available, we could always push up right. to be issuing it in October of this year, you know, or November, and hopefully rates would still be low. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I know Leanne talks about that and has been working very closely with mm -hmm. facilities to, and get these numbers tightened up. So we're ready to, you know, move quickly once it's, um, mm -hmm. the data is available to take advantage of these rates for sure. Yeah. So I guess the suggestion would be, and that's what you're saying, is as soon as you can formulate what the costs are, it's probably we look then again to see okay. if we go in the market rather than wait another year. The FY22 issuance, um, that, that's going to be based on updated numbers. We're working on the budget for FY22 right now, mm -hmm. and they're working through what those projects are. Mm -hmm. So in theory, they could get everything done, and we could be coming back to you in our August meeting mm -hmm. and do it right around budget adoption in September. So we could move it up from April into mm -hmm. August, September timeline. It just depends mm -hmm. on when they get all the data ready and they're working on it. It's just not ready for the deal we're doing right now. And those projects are ready to go. We've already awarded the architects. Um, the contractors um, have been awarded what we call pre-construction. So they're working with the subs to get mm -hmm. the final costs. And we expect those final contracts to be let in eight in May. So we're, or we're doing that COPS issue just in time. The FY22, if we can speed that up, we certainly will. Okay. All right, do we need, are we at the point for? We are to the point that you all could vote, okay. if, unless you have other questions. Uh, is there a motion to approve the issuance of 140? 144 million. Approximately, 144 I guess. Million. Uh, no 
Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Good presentation. Thank you. Good. So we have two other things. I've lumped them into one presentation. Um, it, I called it other items. There's a couple other things we needed to talk about. One was um, reimbursement agreements. So for the COPS issue we're about to do this April and the one we're doing for 2022, um, we've taken, we t already took one agreement to the board. The next, um, we just did it. Um, we needed to get that done quickly and then we have another one coming. Mm -hmm. And it just allows the district to reimburse itself, to reimburse itself for any expenditures that happen prior to the issuance of the debt. So it allows us to make sure that the architects oh, yeah. and contractors can get yeah. started. Right. It's a two, one and a half page document yeah. that's just very generic. It's required for IRS regulations. I just wanted you all to know we did that. Um, one of them went to the board. One of them is going to the board later this month. So you have the, you've done the reimbursement resolution. <coughs> the board has done that. Yeah, we did. We, one of the board approved one January 20th. The next one is February 17th. Normally, I bring all these to you in advance. We've done this. We did it for the last COPS issue, and it was just time sensitive. I went ahead and did that before you've seen it. My apologies. Okay. That's the, um, the notion that you, in order to do taxes and bonds, you have to approve in advance of the expenditures. Okay. Now, if you're going to expend and then fund it, you have a resolution in place. Yeah, typically, on a, on a COPS project, we spend like a million dollars before we issue the debt mm -hmm. and that's well within the guidelines mm -hmm. I just we did the reimbursement agreement for the cops we did in 2020 mm -hmm. and so we're going to start doing these for every transaction mm -hmm. the year before mm -hmm. just to make sure we've got everything mm -hmm. covered that's a good idea so okay well that's fine you that's don't need to do any approval just say unless you all have I concerns I'm going to think that I, that that was a real simple one we did the next one so you do need approval on um our bonded disclosure contracts. Um, we, t we issued them last year, March 2020, and they were set up with one year and four one year extensions. This was at the request of the general counsel's office and I agreed to it, it made sense. Um, so we did that last year and now we're up to do the first extension. So we'll be taking that to the board. It's the same price, the same contract. It's just op exercising the option. And similarly on custody banking, which is that's awarded to TD Bank. They hold the securities on the investments. When we buy treasuries and agencies, they're held by that custody bank. And that contract was issued in March of 2018 for three years with a two-year extension. So we're exercising that option as well. Okay, do we need to approve these? Yes. Okay, and uh, do we need to take them one at a time or no? I think if, if you're gonna approve them all, you can do them all together. All right, is there a motion for these contract extensions for, I guess the four one-year extensions? Second. And then, or for one year extensions, I guess, in one, in one case, the two year extension for the right. bank. Okay, there's a motion. So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I guess we heard from, is that Mike or Paul? I heard Michael. Yes. Um, that was you. Okay. Paul, okay. did we hear your vote? Well, I assume, and as we talked about this at prior meetings, I didn't bring it up this time, but for the people online, we're assuming they're saying yes, they agree, and <laughs> unless we hear them say loudly no, or wave their arms or, or something to let us know that it's no, because sometimes it's hard to get yes. unmuted. <laughs> uh, you don't get the vote, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, the only other thing I have is just in general, thank you all for coming, and for all of you online, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, these are interesting times and we appreciate your willingness to, to work with us as we find safe ways for us to get together. And our next meeting is scheduled for Friday, April 23rd. So a couple months away. Well, thank you for, um, thank you and for all the good work and thank you all for coming. Good to see you. you know, we don't get a chance to socialize. Period. Yes. Now it's a Motion to adjourn. What did you say? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. 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 Okay. All right. Yeah. Aye. 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 We're, we're adjourned. Okay. Thanks. Not to rush. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. <laughs>